but but I I will sort of like um, maybe you, my my colleagues physicists would just say oh you should mention this you should also mention this or you should mention this view I'll just give you a little bit of simplified version but it's better to start this way so essentially that was Einstein's view Einstein thought okay quantum physics is not complete it's provisional it's something like you know. Uh, you build something uh, that's not supposed to last for a long time. It will give you all the statistical prediction, but one day we should be able to discover those hidden variables, hidden parameters, and be able to make precise predictions. So, so in this paper, he showed that, you know, in 1935, that it really just, m there are some ideas, concepts, some potential, um, what he called Gedanken experiments, thought experiments, which shows that there are big arguments that, essentially um, it's, all, it's all just provisional. The, so the, the, the title even of the paper, Can Quantum Mechanical Description of Physical Reality Be Considered Complete? And he thought, certainly not. And then, you know, nothing happened for a while because Einstein was regarded, you know, it was late Einstein, a grumpy old man, okay, whatever. It was very philosophical. The paper didn't actually give any handle to answer this question, whether it's complete or not. 30 years later, there's a, a guy from Northern Ireland, a physicist by the name of John Bell, who works in Switzerland at CERN. His day job is to design better accelerator, but after hours, he goes back into his study or home, and he, he's interested in the foundations of quantum physics. He reads Einstein's paper, and then he comes with a way experimentalists at least can take Einstein's idea and design experiment which can actually show whether Einstein is right or wrong. Is there a more detailed description of reality or not? And Bell comes up with this, what is known as a Bell inequality. So you can see this picture was uh, taken during the discussion with Alain Aspect and other physici French physicists. So John Bell just wrote this um, Bell inequality and he says, okay, if less than two, then Einstein. So it means Einstein is right in this case. But if, if not, the quantum mechanics predicts at least that this particular figure of merit, this parameter that you can measure in the experiment can be greater than two, can be actually as long as two square root of two, right? So it goes a little bit above two. So he says, look, now I give you a testable proposition. You can just experimentally go to your labs, set up experiment, and now you can see whether Einstein was right or not. And, but, you know, experimentalists were not interested in this kind of stuff. You'll be surprised that most physicists are just like no-nonsense kind of people. And usually there is a bit of a tension between philosophers and physicists. Like a serious physicists, especially serious experimental physicists, would consider most philosophers with a bit of a suspicion. You know, those guys, you know, usually they don't know what they are talking about. They use some pompous words. They can in, not even solve a simple equation, which, of course, is not true. I mean, is a... Uh, many, I know, uh, many uh, good counterexample to this claim. But nonetheless, people were not interested in those ideas, surprisingly, even though this is a very fundamental thing. So the, uh, and the first maybe one who took this John Bell paper seriously, wrote to John Bell, said, no, I want to try this experiment, was a young postdoc from Berkeley in 1972. So you see, John Bell does it in like 64, just about 10 years later, someone says, okay, well, let's try it. And uh, another thing is maybe experimental techniques at that time were not really up to it. But this John guy, John Clauser, who was a postdoc against the will of or, or desire of his supervisor, decides to set up this experiment. He loses his job later on. He can, you know, he, obviously the supervisor was not <laughs> very friendly <laughs> to those ideas. So, so the John Klaus essentially leaves physics and he uh, focuses on being a sort of like uh, dealing with a sailing boat and goes sailing and so on and so forth. Um, so that can happen. But, you know, he was the first one who saw the violation of those Bell inequalities. A very messy experiment, but, you know, many ingenious solutions there. And then comes uh, another hero in those experimental verifications of uh, or violations of Bell inequalities is Alain Asper, who actually, and again, you know, that's in the 80s, so, so this, again, 10 years later, essentially, Alain Asper comes al and, and sees the violation of those Bell inequalities. So what does it mean that Einstein is wrong? 
right? So this is like a bit of a shocking thing to the community. And, uh, and that actually shows that somehow there are no hidden variables the way Einstein thought, the so-called local hidden variables. They, they, they are not. So we cannot hope for a better description. But that's kind of shocking. That means, can we always live with only statistical predictions? Where is this randomness coming from? We don't know. So that means like this genuine randomness coming from somewhere. A real genuine randomness, objective randomness out there. Not the subjective thing that we don't know, but maybe God knows or someone knows. The universe knows that there are some hidden parameters that we don't know. That's why we are stupid. We cannot make those predictions. That's not the case. So the, Bell in the violation of Bell inequality says there are no hidden variables of that kind. Absolutely not. We have to live with this. You know, tough luck. Deal with it, right? And so that's actually... Let me now just switch very briefly to another thing. Meanwhile, people working in data security were very much interested in randomness for the purpose of secure communication. Because they knew that in the whole sort of like the history, you know, one can give another lecture about the history of crypto, which is fascinating, by the way. They knew that the randomness play a role if you want to design absolutely secure system. And this randomness comes in, the, in a system that is called a one-time path. So where the message, which is written as a sequence of zeros and ones, is added to something that is random, another randomly generated sequence of zeros and ones. And we assume that the two people who want to communicate, Alice and Bob usually we call them, the Alice on the sending side takes the message, adds this message to the random key one bit by bit. So the cryptogram that is generated acquires this randomness coming from this middle layer, from this uh, red characters, from the cryptographic key. And then she can send this message to anyone. And unless you know the key, it looks like a completely random string of characters to you. You cannot decipher it. But if you have the key, so let's assume that Bob has the key, then you can subtract this randomness and get the message back. So that actually is known as a... This is known to be the best absolutely secure system. As long as the key is as long as the message, the key has to be only used once, hence the name, one time pad. And uh, you shouldn't, uh, so, so each time you want to send a message, you have to just use a new key, which requires a frequent key distribution. And the problem in cryptography was this, that people in data security were trying to solve was this. We know what the perfect system should look like. We know how, how to design a perfect cipher that nobody can break. But there are assumptions. And how we are going to then distribute the key, perfectly secure bits to random bits to Alice and Bob. And nobody knew how to solve this problem. So it's just essentially this, the story is solve this problem where a randomly perfectly correlated bits appear in two different locations. And then you have a perfect cipher. So that, uh, you know, when I started working on this, I went to, and that happened by a sheer chance. You know, I was reading Einstein paper this 1935 paper. And in that paper, Einstein was very careful. He was trying to define what the reality means and so on. So there are many sort of like concepts he defined very carefully. And one was actually a way trying to define what does it mean that there's a physical property that you can measure. And he just, let me read it, uh, wrote, if without any way disturbing a system, we can predict with certainty the value of a physical quantity, then there exists an element of physical reality corresponding to this physical quantity. So to me, it almost sounded like a definition of a perfect eavesdropping. So if someone wants to listen, like your enemy wants to intercept the message, and the, the objective is to be able to read the value of a bit, for example, whether it's zero or one, without disturbing this bit. So this way you can fool people who want to communicate. Then Alice and Bob think that they have established a secret key, but somehow um, an eavesdropper is just listening and, and also hiding its presence. So it's okay if, if you know, for someone listens and you can discover that someone is listening. So at least you know you're not fooled. In this case, you simply say, okay, let's try again, let's try again. But, but you know, the worst case scenario in cryptography is that someone is listening to you and you don't know that there is an eavesdropping going on. 
So, so here Einstein, in a way, defined perfect eavesdropping. And then I knew, of course, that you know that John Bell and others um, managed to set up a system where they show that there is no element of physical reality, that certain things do not exist prior to the measurement. So if it is indeed the case, if the violation of Bell inequalities show you that there are certain properties that somehow you cannot attribute existence to them, there's certain numerical values prior to the measurement, then you can actually use the Bell inequalities to test for the eavesdropping. So to just to conclude the story, I have to say that you know it was difficult to to persuade my, um, you know, some colleagues that it makes sense actually now to show that the Bell inequalities is not only just about philosophy. It can also be used as a test whether someone is listening to the conversation, a test for eavesdropping. And, but I was actually quite lucky. I sided with two colleagues from um, what, is, what used to be called a Defense Research Agency in Malvern, not far away from Oxford, by the way. And... Uh, with lots of you know funny stories around it, uh, we managed actually to set up an experiment which showed uh, that uh, indeed it works. Um, but of course, you know, the, the bureaucracy came up. You know, the experiment was classified, and then we started showing that popular. You know, meanwhile, I, we published some popular articles in Scientific American, and we said to the management, "Look, you cannot be serious. You know, everyone can read it in Scientific American. Why do you classify our experiments?" And so on and so forth. So this is like a different world. And uh, you know, later some other colleagues showed that this test is actually quite powerful in a sense that when you see the violation of Bell inequalities, and uh, that, that can only happen in one particular way, and that opened the gate to something that is known today as device-independent quantum key distribution. Essentially, it's the same idea. You use Bell inequalities to test for eavesdropping, but it actually also tests for the devices that do the key distribution. Um, so several of my colleagues actually came up uh, or pointed out that the protocols that, that I propose, in fact, is good because it allows you in extreme scenario to buy devices even from your enemy. Imagine, this is completely crazy, right? You don't trust someone. And you go to that person and say, look, I cannot produce those devices. You can because you have a superior technology. I don't trust you. But if you can sell those devices, I will run the Bell test on them. If I can see the violation of Bell inequalities, then those devices are good. So these statistical things test the devices. I don't have to open, I don't have to inspect, I don't have to do anything. So that is actually a powerful thing. Of course, usually we don't want to use this in this kind of scenario, but we would like to have a situation where we can produce those devices, but sometimes you can make silly mistakes. In order to you know, avoid those kind of silly engineering mistakes, we may want to use this device-independent quantum key scenario just to be, just to be sure that um, the, the devices work as they should. And this is not, you know, this is not uh, the only theoretical things. Those the, 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 you know, a few years ago, my colleagues in Oxford and also some people in Germany and China showed that device-independent quantum cryptography essentially works. Uh, it was a bit more difficult to prove the security of the whole thing, but, but that happened. So you see now, you can see that at this point, again just to conclude, that uh, the two different approaches, one was the data security, perfect ciphers, the other was, was uh, looking for the foundations of quantum physics were combined. And um, of course, you know, that, that violation of Bell inequalities for the purpose of cryptography presented few more challenges. For example, certain loopholes had to be fixed and so on and so forth. So there was outbursts of experimental work after, after this demonstration that, quantum that uh, the foundations of quantum physics now have a real impact on data security. So before they were just like brave individuals like John Clauser, Alain Speck, and others. Later, a few more physicists just moved into this field and closed various loopholes so like Nicolas Gizem, Anton Zeilinger, John Wei Pan, and, and some other colleagues. Um, and that was uh, already motivated. They had, at least, you know, in their case, they already saw the value of this for the purpose of data security. So those experiments were also quite beautiful. And... Uh, 
so that resulted, as I said, that at least uh, the, the three people um, were awarded the Nobel Prize in 2022 for experimental development of techniques that allow you to see the violation of Bell inequality. So there was a John Clauser on the right, who was the first one, this sort of a postdoc who uh, lost his job as a physicist as the result of his experiments and went sailing. And finally, he got the Nobel Prize. Alain Asper, the guy with the big moustache, I was always scared of him when, he, when I met him as a student. But it's an absolutely fantastic person, you know, very warm, very encouraging, being able to ask lots of penetrating questions. But you see this big moustache, we call him the big moustache guy. Um, then we were all with you know, students, we were kind of a little bit scared of him, but it was a great guy. And Anton from, from, uh, from well, at the time he was in Innsbruck, essentially a Viennese, typical Viennese, who took a, a very broad approach. He was a very accommodating. He was listening to all kinds of different ideas and tried to make sure that uh, he learned from a theorist. So he was one of those experimentalists who were taking theoretical physicists very seriously. So I, was, I have to say that when I was still a PhD student, I had the privilege to be called a visiting professor in Innsbruck, where he was having his lab. He, was, he made me a visiting professor, and, and actually I worked with him a lot on, on some of the ideas that he later got the Nobel Prize. So, you know, it's interesting to see how those... And of course, you know, as always with the Nobel Prize, like there would be a few other names, like I think Nicolas Gizin would be an obvious candidate for this and, uh, and maybe a few other colleagues. Uh, but, you know, they give it only to three people, so there are only three experimentalists who were chosen. So be it. But uh, that actually, you know, if there is a mor any moral of, of the story uh, here, is that it all started with a simple worry of Albert Einstein. And he proved to be wrong. Essentially, today, most people believe there is such a thing like randomness out there. It's something that is not due to the lack of our knowledge. It may well be that one day quantum physics will be just modified. Maybe we'll get some insight, but probably not in that direction. The Bell theorem says, no, don't look for hidden, don't look for at least local hidden variables. There are certain things that it maybe can happen, but this is the thing. And uh, one may ask, okay, is this the end of the story? Is Einstein absolutely wrong? Well, you know, there are a few ways around, so it's not the case that it's absolutely wrong. It's not the end of the worry. There are certain things, we, we make certain assumptions. For example, in the implementation of Bell inequalities, we already assume that there's some randomness in the choice of measurements we do, and so on and so forth. So it's not crystal clear. I don't want you to leave this place with the impression that physicists worked it out completely. It's not the case. There are many open questions still in the field. But what is interesting that this fusion of cryptography and quantum physics is, is sort of a beautiful synergy of the two. So the quantum physics is helping cryptography to make perfect ciphers. At the same time, cryptography established or elevated the status of doing foundations of quantum physics to a higher level. Prior to that, people who were working on the foundations were treated a little bit like the loonies and you know weird guys nothing practical, don't do this, why is that important? But now, I think they just proved that the cryptography gave them sort of like another lifeline, saying, look, this is actually important. What you are doing has a real impact on data security. So that means that if there's any moral, there's a lot to be discovered be between different disciplines. We just sort of started thinking about the nature in terms of classifying, this is mathematics, this is crypto, this is physics. But in fact, there's a lot in between. And I think the most interesting place, the most interesting discoveries that we'll see in years to come will be in that area. So thank you very much. Sure. Right. So it was uh, a bit longer than half an hour. No, te, no worries <laughs> at all. So, bueno, eh, voy a hablar en español. Entonces, ahora hay un turno de preguntas que, en principio, pues eh, se anima a, a la audiencia que, que si quieren formular alguna pregunta, eh, el profesor Ecker se responderá. Eh, si hay alguien que quiere preguntar, que levante la mano. Eh, nuestro compañero pasa un micrófono.
Tenemos aquí una primera pregunta. Y, y la hago en... En español, en español porque él, él bueno. puede entender. ¿no? Ah. Ah, aquí. Bueno, es, es, es sobre el experimento en sí mismo. Primero, eh, ¿cuántos laboratorios lo pueden hacer ahora mismo? Y segundo, eh, eh, es, ¿va a ser factible...? Sí. No sé, ¿va a ser factible que un estudiante... Yeah, yeah, I, I, can, I can hear and understand you. I see that the translation is good. Sí, o sea, y, y va a ser factible que, que un estudiante de, de, de física vea su, su, ese experimento en, en sus estudios? Yes, the short answer to your question is yes. At the moment, uh, the technology is so good that there are places already um, where you can actually do the practical. It's, it's designed for students to perform those experiments. You can see the violation of building inequalities in labs. So it's, today is not, cons at least at the very basic level. So yes, uh, for educational purposes, it's perfectly feasible and uh, it can be done in any university lab. The technology is essentially based on a very simple quantum optics experiments. You see, the main difficulty in the past was to design a system where you can generate what is called entangled particles, and uh, usually like two entangled photons. But, but, but now the technology is really good enough so that uh, we know how to do those things efficiently in a process called parametric down conversion. You need a certain crystal, you do it. You have to have pretty good detectors, but again, not a big deal. So it's not like, it's not like a rocket science today. The basic demonstration of the violation of bell inequalities, students can do it today. Gracias. Alguien más? Sí. Sí, eh, gracias. Uh, can I speak in English? Yeah? It's, okay. Sí, sí. Uh, so, uh, can you elaborate a bit more on this assumption that you said about the bell inequalities? What are the, the assumptions that could be wrong? So, one assumption that um, is important that I mention here is that in the process of violating, of constructing this violation of Bell inequalities, there are two different locations, and in each location you choose randomly one of two different observables to measure, one of two different things to measure. And those have to be random choices. You have to have either local random number generator or somehow you may think, okay, I'll do those choices myself. If that is not the case, it, it, you may consider a scenario where everything is super deterministic and prescribed, and you can see the violation of the Bell inequalities. So the notion of the random choices implies that there is a genuine randomness, that, uh, that those random choices are not predefined, not prescribed prior to those things. So that's, that's, that's one. And of course, you know, in other, there are also other things that you assume that uh, is a non-signaling, for example, that you cannot, one device cannot just signal to the other one. You also, um, for the purpose of Bell inequalities used for device independent quantum key distribution, you also have to assume that uh, your detectors are pretty good. They have to be at the, above a certain threshold level. You know, usually when you do the key distribution, the, the conventional one, you, you just look only at the events that happen. Any detector is not perfect, right? So sometimes the detector will not register a photon. And usually it's okay to neglect those things. You simply say, okay, I don't care about those cases where a photon was not detected. I only look at the cases when it was detected. But in the device-independent quantum crypto, you cannot do this because it's just there are certain attacks on the system where eavesdropper can actually hide behind those um, uh, cases where there was uh, was no uh, click in the detector. So, so there are a number of assumptions, but the, the one I was referring to, philosophically speaking, was you cannot still refute what is called a super determinism, which is the case where 
everything is predetermined, including your choices of uh, the measurements. So, so saying that quantum physics now explicitly is pointing in the direction of objective randomness is, is not entirely true, that there are some other ways of explaining those things. But I would say that still the mainstream belief is that nobody actually wants to believe in a super determinist because that would imply that you don't have a free will at all. Gracias. Eh, ¿Más preguntas? Bueno, yo quería preguntar eh, alguna cuestión muy general. Eh, es, es tan general como eh, ¿qué, es, ¿qué podemos entender por tecnología cuántica? Eh, si es tan importante para el futuro, ¿cómo va a influir en, en nuestra vida diaria, digamos? Es algo muy general, ¿no? Right. So the, the first part of the question is um, maybe easier to answer because what's going to happen in the future is, of course, uh, very <laughs> difficult to say. But um, if you look at quantum physics, uh, it already had a significant impact on the um, technology that we use today. If you look at the semiconductors, we use various quantum phenomena like tunneling and so on to build, uh, you know, every single person probably these days in this in this place would have a mobile phone or something. So this quantum technology of the first generation is already there. Now we are talking, sometimes people refer about the new quantum phenomena, which is called the second quantum revolution, where we are going to use coherent quantum phenomena to design maybe a better computers, maybe better communication schemes, and... Um, better sensors, for sure, better atomic clocks, uh, better frequency standards. Uh, we can actually go for more precise measurements of the uh, gravitational field. So um, the second quantum revolution is coming. It's quite clear that we can now domesticate, control those phenomena. And, uh, and it's very difficult to say um, how important it will be. I think it will be of significant importance. It's just going to change the way we, we do data processing, we communicate, but I think First, most likely, it will be just in a super precise measurement. Mm -hmm. Gracias. Y en este sentido, eh, eh, por ejemplo, en, en San Sebastián, en Donostia, eh, eh, habrá un ordenador cuántico en 2025. Eh, entonces, por ejemplo, en, en este caso particular, eh, ¿podría explicar la diferencia entre una computadora cuántica y una normal, eh, conceptual, físicamente? Right, so, so that, uh, the, to start with, I think that the usage, like the quantum computer, one has, to, one has to be a bit careful, right? So what we have today is not like a, a fully-fledged quantum computer. Those are like a very noisy devices that contain a certain number of qubits in which you can make some operations. They're quite interesting from a you know, technological point of view. But it's not obvious that at this level we can see any quantum advantage. But it's just, you know, it's a start. Mm -hmm. So probably it will take years before we actually build a really fault-tolerant quantum computer where we can really explore those um, phenomena. So I would say, okay, let's have whatever IBM has at this point or Google or, or any other company and let's play with it. It's, it's a good thing, interesting physics. But to say that this is already a quantum computer that most us working in this field at the very beginning, think of like a super powerful device that no noise, you know, you can mm -hmm. implement beautiful algorithms that show a real advantage of quantum computation over classical. That's still not the case. That it still has years to come. But uh, I think it will eventually come because there's no obvious reason why it shouldn't. If it, if it doesn't come for a good reason, that would be even more beautiful because we discover something new about nature. Mm -hmm. But... Um, uh, the how do they work those devices? What is a conceptual thing? So that's again the using the as I mentioned that the probability theory as we know has to be modified, right? So the quantum physics is a new way of doing probability and sometimes the probability that we see um are probability of certain outcomes can be made greater than in a classical case due to the some something called quantum interference. Mm -hmm. So this process of quantum interference this gives this extra power to quantum devices. So you can design new class of algorithms where using you can amplify the probability of good answers and 
decrease the probability of bad answers through quantum constructive and destructive interference. So that means that uh, this is a new generation of devices that offer a new way of programming and therefore they can actually be more efficient. It doesn't mean that they are faster in the traditional meaning of this sense. Actually, probably they are slower. Those quantum gates will be slower than the classical t that we have today. But they are more clever. They can solve problems in a more clever way. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Y, por ejemplo, usted predice que en unos años podríamos tener computadoras cuánticas en nuestro escritorio, al igual que tuvimos las tenemos ahora en las computadoras que tenemos. I think I think the most likely that uh, it will not it will not be entirely a quantum computer, but most likely a hybrid device where you have some quantum component to it, because it's not the case that everything, absolutely everything will be improved by quantum processing. We know that there are certain cases that will not be improved and for some others there will be no reason to use quantum computers. Mm -hmm. So I think there will be probably a, you know, maybe a quantum processor, a dedicated machine. Or it could be like there will be a, at the very beginning a big quantum computer somewhere and you can just connect to this computer, send your data and receive the output. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Gracias. No sé si hay alguna pregunta más. En el auditorio, alguien que se quiere... A ver, tenemos dos. Eh, empezamos por aquí. Ah, on... Vale, bien, sí, da igual. Luego más contigo. Uh, I actually have two questions. The first one, um, you, you said before that uh, the devices, the, uh, the building quality checking devices, um, use entangled particles. So, could you please explain why it is necessary to have entangled particles for that device? And the second question is, um, for quantum computers, is it not necessary to have them at like um, almost absolute uh, zero um, temperature to have, to have them work properly? So wouldn't that make them unviable for, for you know, everyday life? Um, so, okay, your, your first question was why entanglement is necessary, right? So, the, um, so entanglement provides you with the, if your objective, from crypto perspective, right? If your objective is that there are two individuals that are far away from each other, right? And then you would like the, to have a perfectly correlated sequence of zeros and ones, truly random, but identical. So each sequence is random, but there are two identical sequences in two different locations. So for this, you need strong correlation. So the fact that if you generate a zero here, you also get a zero here, roughly speaking. And in order to generate such perfectly correlated things that are also secure, you have to go beyond classical correlations because if you do it in a classical way, it's prone to eavesdropping. But it turns out that the entanglement is just, you may, one way of thinking about quantum entanglement is just you think about correlations but which are much stronger, that you have two entities and they feel each other, they behave like one entity essentially. So if you do something to this one, something will happen here. And so for this ability to generate identical sequences of number, you need those correlations and if you want to do it in a quantum way, that's that's essentially quantum entanglement that has to be the game. If there's no correlations whatsoever, no entanglement that you cannot generate identical sequences. So that's, yes. So um, wouldn't that violate the principle that uh, information cannot be transmitted at a higher speed than yeah. light? That's, that's a very good point. It doesn't for the following reason. You see, Entanglement makes it possible to have the following experiment. If you and I share an entangled pair, I perform the measurement and I get zero, I know that when you perform the measurement, you get zero. Okay? Instantaneously, I know. However, if you think very carefully about this experiment, I cannot predict whether my measurement gives me zero or one. So when I choose the measurement, I see zero, or I can see one. If I see zero, I know you will see zero. If I see one, I know you will see one. But I, yeah, I have no control upon the outcome of the measurement. So in which case, I cannot convey any information to you instantaneously. Because 
conveying information, sending, I have to choose the bit value. So for example, you know, it's important, we agree that zero means do something and one means don't do it. So in this experiment, I cannot do it. I cannot transfer this information because it randomly pops either zero or one with the same probability. So that gives you a perfect correlation but doesn't give you instantaneous information flow. So this randomness saves actually Einstein, um, uh, Einstein sort of locality thing. So you, there's, no, there's no instantaneous communication at this point. And uh, so uh, you, you see this, right? This, this argument, good. And the, the, um, your second question was about um, the second part of your question. You also asked about uh, something else, which I... Oh, yeah, repeaters, yes, yes, I, I got it. So, so about quantum repeaters. Um, yes, of course, you know that um, there are all kinds of technological requirements, but I think that to the best of my knowledge, people can handle the temperature issues, but the problem is to have a quantum repeater would work this way, that you have two incoming photons, right? And, uh, or just, you know, you have to, you have to somehow make sure that the signal, the, yeah, so, so that in quantum repeaters you actually have two incoming photons. And because those incoming photons may not come at the same time exactly, you need to have a little bit like a quantum memory there. So you can store one excitation or store whatever, the same quantum state that was brought by a photon for a while until you get the other one and you can perform a Bell measurement on those two. So there are some other challenges. But, but temperature would be one of them for sure in most technologies. Hola, buenas. Eh, hoy en día muchos dispositivos usan protocolos RSA. No obstante, se dice que las computadoras cuánticas pueden, eh, ponen en jaque esos protocolos. ¿Cómo se están preparando las entidades actualmente ante esto? Ok, so, so now you are pointing to another interesting development in the field. You're absolutely right. So, we have, I didn't talk about public key crypto systems in my talk, but they do exist and they're a wonderful solution to the problem of the key distribution. It's a beautiful mathematical solution and RSA that you mentioned is one of them. Now, you're absolutely right that doing the Shor's algorithm, implementing Shor's algorithm on a quantum computer, we will be able to make uh, those systems which are based on factoring or discrete log uh, or even elliptic curves crypto, they, they will be vulnerable to quantum attacks. So we know that we cannot keep those things forever because as soon as we have quantum computer, and may happen, you know, 20, 50, 100 years from now, but eventually most likely it will happen. So we have to modify the encryption things. And you may say, okay, well, let's don't worry because if a quantum computer will just pop up maybe 50 years from now, why should we worry now? But we should. Because one reason why we should be worried is a, is a technique which is called collect data today, decrypt later. Imagine that there are certain secrets that have a lifetime, or they should be secret maybe for, let's say, 100 years, like some national security issues. When it comes to medical record, you would like to keep them secret for the lifetime of a person, more or less. So there are certain things that should remain secret for a certain longer period of time. So imagine that your enemy, for example, will do the following, will collect the data that are now encrypted using RSA. Every old traffic, you cannot, you cannot read it, but you collect it, collect it, collect it, and store it. And you wait until the progress in quantum technology happens, and then you have a quantum computer, and you decrypt the data that still has some value to you. So this is a real danger. So that means perhaps we should do something now. And so what we are doing now is there's a new field people call, some people call it post-quantum crypto, some people call it uh, quantum resilient thing. You are trying to come with a problem or a system that is going to be difficult also to a quantum computer. So like RSA is based on factoring two numbers. It's a difficult mathematical problem for classical computers. It's not difficult for quantum computers. So now the question is, can we find another mathematical problem where 
we know that this problem will be difficult also for quantum computers. And build a new crypto system, similar to RSA, kind of, public key crypto system up on this new problem. And that is actually the most important development in the last few years, where government agencies, like, for example, National Security Agency, had a worldwide competition for the next generation of standards that you can implement now and that would be resilient to quantum attacks. And then, you know, this, the whole competition had some hiccups because many of those even shortlisted candidates at some stage uh, turned out to be completely breakable, even by classical means. So there were a bit embarrassing moments there, but it was a good thing, you know, that the, the, the whole community was sort of like looking at what kind of crypto systems are proposed and look at the vulnerable points and so on and so forth. So at the end, we have some idea, so the companies now are encouraged, there will be a standard in post-quantum, based roughly on some mathematical problem related to the lattices, where mathematicians play with the concept of the lattices and are looking for some vectors in those lattices. So it seems that this mathematical problem, at least for now, is difficult to a quantum computer. Whether this will be always the case, not clear. So there's lots of a nervousness there that maybe those things that were chosen are not really secure. But nonetheless, to, to, a short answer to your story, now p companies are encouraged to implement post-quantum crypto, and, and some of them already do. So some of those messengers are protected by an extra layer of software with, uh, which has this post-quantum cryptography. So that's, that's essential. But you know, the problem, the difference between post-quantum and quantum is such that with post-quantum, we cannot prove that this is going to be absolutely secure. Maybe it turns out that in the next few years or maybe even tomorrow, uh, someone will find a quantum algorithm that actually shows that the quantum computers can also break those kind of mathematical problems. With quantum crypto, that is not going to happen because it just relies directly on the laws of physics. So you have to change physics, which you cannot do, right? So to make those things breakable. So it's a long answer to your question, but it was a very, very good question. Uh, hi. Um, so um, maybe this is a more naive question, but uh, putting aside all the technological uh, problems that we have right now, and you already gave in these answers a bit what would be the path for the future, but could you uh, envision what is your what is your uh, uh, prediction of what would be quantum communication, quantum network, quantum networks, and all this in the future in quantum? Yes, and, yes. Yeah. Like putting aside technological problems. It's um, you know it's very very difficult to be a prophet and just see the vision of the future. Because imagine, imagine the following scenario. You know that there was this guy called Charles Babbage who was the first one who came up with a concept of programmable computer, right? So it was based on mechanical devices. It was a 19th century concept. And imagine now that you go to this guy and see, okay, you came up with this computer, the clock wheels and everything, what is it good for? What's the future for this device? And he will probably then give you a very simple answer saying, well, you know, most likely it's going to be good to produce mathematical tables without any errors, because that was his original idea. So he saw that when people were doing those things, errors creeped up and there were even situations where you couldn't be absolutely sure that those mathematical tables are really accurate anymore. But he would never be in a position to tell you about internet, about word processors, about social media, about internet and communication. It was beyond the imagination of this guy, absolutely. And nonetheless, you know, it just, it happened. So now we are in a very similar situation. I can, you know, stick my head out and tell you, okay, I think that maybe quantum simulations, new materials, um, we will come up with a secure internet, entanglement will become a resource like electricity, you know, that you would like to have a provision of entanglement for some interesting purposes, and so on and so forth. But the honest answer is, you know, 
most likely, whatever I say today, 10 years from now, people will be laughing at me and say, you know, those guys were absolutely stupid. They couldn't see this, they couldn't see that, they couldn't see this world coming. So I think the best strategy is just to produce those quantum tools and give it to people to play with. There are so many clever people out there and they will make a good use out of those devices and we'll be surprised with all, all applications. So I think just be prepared to be surprised. I think that's, that's my answer to this. Thank you. Any other Por concretar esto, entonces, por ejemplo, ¿cuál pueden, en su opinión, son los obstáculos reales que se, a los que se enfrenta hoy, hoy en día? Ya sabemos, ha hablado de los desarrollos, el futuro. ¿Cuáles son los obstáculos, digamos, reales a los que se enfrentan los investigadores a la hora de desarrollar, por ejemplo, la, la comunicación cuántica? Well, quantum communication, quantum computing in general, so we have the, the main challenge, of course, is to make sure that this noise from the environment is not affecting the action. The reason you don't see those quantum phenomena on a daily basis is because they're very fragile. As soon as you open up your system or your experiment to any external influence, you lose this coherent phenomena, those quantum interference inside. So this process is known as decoherence in, in, the, uh, in the technical language. Now, so that's the bad news. There is decoherence. The good news is that we can do something about it. And this something about it is called quantum error correction and quantum fault tolerant computation. And, um, but to implement, so, so quantum error correction is like to protect this quantum interference, but building more complex system, that the interference happens inside. It's kind of screened by some many other things around it. And to do that requires building a, um, going to a certain threshold. You have a certain number of quantum bits that they have to interact, they have to be of good quality before you will be able to implement this. So this is actually the most challenging part. Right now we don't have a really good uh, implementations of quantum error correcting. We, we, I mean, there's lots of beautiful experiments and ideas where to go, uh, but we're still waiting for abilities to go into a threshold where you can actually build and scale up those error correcting codes. So that's the major obstacle. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm sure that you know each technology also has its own set of problems. Like people working ion traps, so they have they worry about certain things. People working with superconducting qubits, so they they worry about some other aspects. But those are technology specific worries. Whereas when you like, what are the general problems? That is like fight this decoherence, make this quantum happen, screen it somehow, and make it happen inside. Mm -hmm. Gracias. Eh, Alguna pregunta más? Is working. Okay. Uh, first of all, thank you for for the very nice talk. And I would like to ask um, if there's any hope for this for this kind of experiment to give an answer to questions from foundations of the quantum mechanics, like maybe to throw out some interpretation for, of quantum mechanics or something like that. Yes. Well, this is actually. Uh, it's, it's <laughs> very. I'm glad that you you asked this question because actually, when people ask me personally, like, what do I think would be the major benefit of quantum computation? That my answer is, it doesn't usually go in the direction of sort of like along this building a quantum computers for this and this and that. What I think is fascinating, like in our understanding of nature, is that we came with quantum physics, right? We have quantum theory, and it kind of works. It's a bit weird, you know, makes those statistical predictions, there are various interpretation how it works, but it works. There's not a single experiment at the moment that we can see deviation from quantum physics. And then you may ask questions, okay, will we see experiment? Most likely, yes, right? That's, it would be weird to say this is the end of story, that we found the ultimate theory which already the progress will stop here in our understanding of nature almost certainly is not the case almost certainly we will learn more and more and more there will be a day there will be experiment where we see that the quantum predictions go wrong now the good question is when of course and what kind of experiment so if you ask me personally 
I want to encourage everyone to build a quantum computer and to see them fail for a good reason. For the reason is because, you know, building a quantum computer, when you think about it, is the most challenging experiment the whole mankind ever tried, in my view. Being able to control those thousands of elementary components, make them interact the way it is, it's, it's amazing. It's the most complex experiment that will be produced ever. So if you think about building quantum computer as about setting an experiment, a physical experiment, so this one is probably the most sophisticated, the most demanding, really, really challenging thing. So this will be most likely, in my view, an experiment where you, if you see any deviation from quantum theory, it may be there. Of course, you know, some other people may have a bet on some other things, on gravity and this. But I think that if, if there is a sophisticated, very complex quantum experiment where things can go wrong, for, meaning that the predictions of quantum physics can be, refu you can see a refutation of quantum theory, then the chances are that this is going to be this experiment. But now, of course, you know, so this, this will be like quantum computers, then it will give us a new physics. Because at this very moment, this is like what we theoretical physicists and physicists are waiting for. Not that the experiment work as predictions happen. You know, that's nice to see that we, you know, but no, no number of repetitions of a given experiment will make um, our knowledge uh, progressing. It will just, it doesn't make even sure that we are more confident in those things. But a single experiment that shows that something is wrong is the most valuable experiment because then it shows that you have to work harder, find another guess. We can never prove that the physical theory is correct because no number of confirmation makes it more correct. But we can always make it not correct. We can always make it false. We can falsify it by showing one experiment where it just goes in contradictions to those predictions. And this is the hope for quantum physics. But of course, you know, this is also, so this is very optimistic from the point of view of those who want to see the progress in science, but it's also optimistic for those who are interested in the progress of technology, because this new physics that will come after quantum theory, will also lead to more powerful quant devices, computing devices that you can build using this, this new theory, right? Because the, you know, computation is, not, is a physical process. It's not mathematics, really. It just happens in nature. And what you can compute, how you can compute, depends on the physics you know. We discovered quantum physics, you start computing in a different way. What comes after quantum physics will gives you a more, even more powerful computation. So this will be probably a win-win situation. So the best scenario for me is like one day we build a quantum computer, we try hard, and then, you know, surprisingly, you wake up on a Saturday morning, switch on the device, and see that something goes wrong, not according to the prediction this way on, or another. And that's, that would be the most beautiful thing that would happen to these things. And I think for, for the foundation, it will have very, very significant effects. So that may change our worldview. Bueno, vamos a terminar con la última pregunta que me gustaría, ya que he mencionado, por ejemplo, y personalmente, ¿qué puede hacer, por ejemplo, una disciplina como las matemáticas en esta corriente quantum? Oh, it has a significant impact on, on mathematics in, in both ways. So first of all, you know, uh, quantum technology, like even talking about quantum error correcting codes, the number of mathematical topics that come into this, we're talking about topology, we're talking about homology, we're talking about understanding um, all kinds of areas of mathematics that, 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 that are needed actually to contribute to the progress in this field. So first of all, Doing quantum information science borrows from all different areas of mathematics. And going the other way around, it's, it's also interesting to consider situations, for example, where quantum computation may help with a notion of certain mathematical things. For example, myself and a colleague of mine, David Deutsch, who we proposed the idea that when you think about a notion of a mathematical proof, Usually when you ask a mathematician to prove something, what you mean is that, okay, take the axioms, take a piece of paper and write well, line by line by line how from the axioms follows the statement that you want to prove, right? And then you invite your fellow mathematicians, they just look at this and you know, they go and 
say, okay, this is a, I'm convinced, this makes sense, and you know, you, you look a few times and then you make a statement, okay, this is a valid mathematical proof. Sometimes it's difficult because the community is small, you know, there are stories in mathematics where, where it's difficult to do it this way, but nonetheless, it's possible. Sometimes, you know, this requires some computations that you can delegate to the machine, but then you can at least check those things, like, you know, there are certain mathematical statements that were proved by computers. But then imagine that you have a mathematical statement that you know that a quantum computer can prove, but a quantum computer cannot generate a record because any record, any, you know, generating a record means like stop computation now, print the record, your stage, and so on and so forth. So you will have a situation, possibly, in mathematics, where you will be, the computer comes and says, okay, this logical proposition is true. And, but you say, why? And then you say, well, it's true, I cannot provide you a record. But you understand how quantum computer works. Mm -hmm. You really have understanding how the process took place. So would you believe this mathematical proof or not? You know the device, you know how the device works, and the device comes with a mathematical statement, this logical proposition is true. But you cannot, the device cannot produce, producing a physical record would generate like, there would be maybe not enough atoms in the whole universe to just see this record. So it's physically impossible. And it's interesting when you ask people, mathematicians in particular, like hardcore mathematicians or logicians this question, so they really have two different views. So there are those who say, okay, well, I would accept this. If I understand how the system works, I would accept this proof. And some wouldn't. So, and this shifts the, from the physical point of view, the first idea of a proof is a physical record, that you have something written down. And this would be a shift from the physical record to a physical process. Mm -hmm. You say, you don't require a physical record anymore, but I at least require a physical process that I understand that gives you the answer. Whether mathematicians will be happy with that or not, I don't know, but we, <laughs> we propose it seriously. So, you know, the, the impact can actually go in very in very significant way on the, on the foundations of logic and mathematics mm -hmm. as well. Mm -hmm. Bueno, pues muchas gracias. Yo creo que ha sido muy interesante. Eh, creo que tenemos que agradecer al profesor Ecker. Un aplauso. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Y aquí terminamos. Muchas gracias. Thank you.